Hi everyone, this is Jason Barak of Wall Street from Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street from Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is uh, uh, a returning guest. We've had him on a number of times. I've also been on his radio show that gets posted on the Washington Times. He's a columnist for the Washington Times. He's worked on Wall Street for a long time, graduated Yale. Uh, he's one of the chairman of Newport Value Partners, which provides uh, research to hedge funds, high net worth clients, and institutions. Thank you for joining us again, Charles Ortel. Thanks for having me on, Jason. Now, um, Charles, uh, you've been writing articles ab- about the fake recovery uh, recently. Uh, what, what's your opinion on, on the recovery? Um, it, it seems to me that a lot of the jobs that were created since 2009 were – a lot of the high-paying full-time jobs were shale oil jobs. And with this fall in oil prices, it seems that that thesis that you know the economy is recovering because of um, the oil market and the shale jobs, that the- thesis is now falling apart. Yeah, I mean, what I found, my, my background is, is very much in investing, uh, economics, geopolitics, uh, in places where people have um, subjective opinions, but they're formed around actual investigation of facts. This administration in particular, the one, the Obama administration that took power on uh, January 20th, 2009, is run by a combination of economically illiterate men and women and political uh, sycophants who are simply trying to sell a story to uh, a wider population that until now hasn't really bothered to investigate the facts. The facts are out there. Um, They're published indeed. uh, A lot of the work that I do is just to take information published by President Obama's own team in the Commerce Department, in the uh, Bureau of Economic Analysis and uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics and elsewhere. The data that is put out by his own team shows very clearly, first and foremost, that there have been no new full-time equivalent jobs created since 2007, which was the peak, 2007-8, which was the peak of, of, of employment in this country in the private sector. None. So, wow. So when he, you know, and, and then if you want to start segregating, and I can direct your uh, audience to, to where to look. You go on the Bureau of Economic Analysis, National Income and Products Account, website section six lays all this information back it is possible on a consistent basis to look at this from 1998 forward and then they adjust uh the way in which they uh, dissect all this information but they have tables that go all the way back to 1929 by year and in some cases by quarter and when you look at that most important statistic first the level of full-time equivalent jobs now what do i mean by that this administration counts a part-time waitressing job is equivalent to a full-time scientist, and it's just not the case. You, you've got to look at – you've got to adjust for the number of hours, and this administration, as past administrations have done, goes and has this data already presented. So when President Obama gives yet another uh, error-laden speech, uh, State of the Union speech that was filled with falsehood after falsehood about economics, about geopolitics – most of the mainstream media, and I congr- congratulate you and, and your partner, Moda Wood, uh, most of the mainstream media are very good with words, but not so good with numbers, and they don't look at this number. So the first number that says there isn't a, 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 a recovery is that one. The next is that the best survey put out by this government and, and prior governments is the Consumer Expenditure Survey, and I highly commend your audience looking into that. That survey comes out. Uh, it's wholly consistent from 2004 to 2013, which is the last full year for which the data is available. It's free. It's online. They slice the entire population of American households all sorts of different ways. So you can get a sense of spending habits, savings habits, income habits. They do it by quintile. They do it by race. They do it by gender. They do it by region. And it's all done for you. Just look at it. That information shows crystal clear that – Under the Obama administration, household incomes, pre- and post-tax incomes, are under where they were in the recent peak for every segment of society, from the rich, by quintile, from the richest, next. Every single quintile is worse off in terms of income and savings under this president, despite the fact that what what has happened since – Uh, December 2008, this administration and the Federal Reserve Bank and central banks around the world have created a set of external conditions where it should have been possible to do well. But these extraordinary conditions are inflating a gigantic bubble that it now seems is going to bust and hurt everybody even worse. 
Yeah, I mean, it's not just the employment numbers, Charles, that are cooked. I mean, they're obviously you said they're 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 counting the um, part time jobs as full time jobs now, just as desperation filled those numbers in. The Bureau of Labor Statistics is doing you know the birth death model it seems every month or every quarter to fill in the gaps, so the the model seasonally adjusts uh, extra jobs. It adds jobs out of thin air. The birth death model itself is, I think, total rubbish. Um, you know, it's just false assumption after false assumption by statistical uh, by PhDs in statistics in statistics um you know the gdp numbers don't count the real well anywhere close to the real inflation rate so if you're account if you're looking at obviously my food bill and my uh insurance co health insurance costs have gone up a lot if they're adding those things in yes the oil price has dropped my gasoline bills down a little bit but i think that's temporary if you're looking at uh, an honest more accurate inflation rate of say five or six percent like john williams of shadow stats there wouldn't be any positive gdp growth so it's nominal fake GDP growth. You know, they always have to underestimate inflation. And, you know, we could go like this down through almost all the different types of statistics, whether that's the CPI number, GDP, unemployment, et cetera, et cetera. I think all of these are cooked. And it's not just the U.S. doing it, Charles. I, I think it's Europe. I think it's Japan. I think China's definitely been doing it for a very long time. So it, it just seems that everyone is trying to do this right now. And the markets have let these governments um, get away with it, I guess. I guess they want to let them get away with it because a lot of the people, you know, who are in the markets, I guess, they have money, they have capital, unlike a lot of people on Main Street, to buy assets. And if you have money to buy assets, right, you probably don't want your asset prices falling like crazy um, when, you know, the reality says that fun, um, when the fundamental reality says that these asset prices should be valued much lower, uh, they want the asset prices higher. And I think we've had such a huge disconnect um, between the capital markets, the um, the stock market, the bond market, the real estate markets in the U.S. Um, compared to reality. Well, let me go two ways with that. I think no, – or actually three observations. Uh, on GDP, GDP is a horrible construction. It is a bad number. It is not reflective of, of the course of, uh, of economic progress. And a far better way of looking at it, I think, is, is focus on private sector wages, compare those wages, determine those wages per full-time equivalent worker, and then also look at the total amount of debt on, on this economy and any economy. Those figures are available. Those, like you say, all, all statistics have, have problems. The statistics put out by our Federal Reserve System, the so-called Z1 tables that are, uh, again, available online and show by quarter and by year back to 1945, the total amount of debt on this economy, that is to say long-term debt. When you look at those, the, the, the trajectory of the debt, it has soared. It is monstrously high. It is higher now, or the most recent date, I think, is September 2014. The balance then was higher than it was right before the worst of the worst time in, the, in this 2008-9 crash. Uh, so debt is higher. Incomes are under, under siege. And then we can have a discussion about, you know, your point about inflation and also the real value of the dollar. I mean, how should we be thinking about that? Is it CPI? Is it versus gold? Is it versus other things? So, you know, this is, this is an economy that has been uh, pushed once again over the precipice. Our government and allied governments, I think, are making irresponsible statements, encouraging irresponsible behavior, to, uh, uh, affecting, you know, the most vulnerable among us. The young people are being saddled with gigantic student loans, urged now to go into community college programs, which I would guess will not lead to their finding productive, remunerative work. Um, after all, this isn't about, you know, the competition for scarce labor. First of all, it's not simply a geographic thing. It's not like we're just competing against people in India or other places that are prepared to work a lot harder. The brutal reality under this president is that the, the natural compact between the boss and the worker has changed to the point where bosses are naturally saying, why should we employ humans at all when we can go and get machines that are getting cheaper and more powerful on a daily basis? We don't have to worry about a union with these machines. We don't have to worry about, uh, frankly, managing them. We don't have to worry about the high the, you know, error rates and other problems. And that's why you're seeing, I mean, today there's a story, and in, in of all places, uh, China, Foxconn, which is, I think, Apple's major supplier, is, is now looking at replacing human, cheap human labor in China with, with more robots. Amazon has already done it. Wall Street's doing it. 
and the future is staring everybody in the face except those who work in the public sector uh, and in, in theory protected union jobs is that human labor is under siege. And meanwhile, these economically illiterate, illiterate and it's, it's, it's a compliment to call them fools, I don't think they're that smart, are, are, are wrecking the basic bargain uh, available to people who want to put capital to work inside this country as opposed to other places. Yeah, well, I, I think this goes back to mm-hmm. – Nothing. Go ahead. Oh, I, I think this goes back to Keynesian economics and financial repression. So what what we have here, you know, Keynes wrote in the general theory at the end, at the very end, was about, you know, euthanizing the rentier class and basically destroying capital and allowing the central planners, the bureaucrats, to allocate the capital because he believed that people shouldn't really have that much savings and that they were irresponsible with their savings and that the government was uh, and central planning would be a lot more accurate with allocating capital in the economy and that consumers, if they had money through wages and earnings, should just spend it. So I, I think that combined with financial repression – and you have Japan in financial repression, you have Europe in financial repression, you have the U.S. in financial repression with artificially suppressed interest rates. Uh, obviously, I think given the risks in the economy, especially with potential defaults you know, from these uh, shale oil producers, they, I think they borrowed at only around 5% some of these guys. Considering the risk, the, the interest rate should have been much higher. Um, and you know, you can make arguments like that throughout other, uh, the rest of the economy for people who borrowed way too cheaply. Is that you know these guys realize that they're trapped. Japan has been trapped for a long time, and they just keep printing yen. And you know um, because there's not demand for for Japanese government bonds in their private sector really that much anymore. The U.S. is headed down that road. Uh, I think the market thinks that uh, the most people on Wall Street at least believe that the interest rates can be raised um, sometime this year in 2015. But I, I think the Fed is trapped. I think maybe they try a token interest rate, maybe quarter point or two or something like that, uh, maybe a couple quarter point raises. And then, you know, the things start to really uh, – obviously, I agree with you that the real economy is – is it hasn't really recovered at all that much since uh, 2008. But, um, you know, with the interest rate rise, it could potentially collapse everything again. Then the Fed's going to have to step in and probably start printing even more money and, and try to knock the interest rates back down. This is assuming they even raise interest rates at all. I'm not sure they can at all. You see, I, I have a slightly uh, darker view, and I notice uh, uh, I, I tend to follow um, Zero Hedge very closely. and They have a, a great article by a, a, a hedge fund manager pointing out that we're on the verge, in his view, and I share this view, of uh, an economic depression that will be, I think he says, remembered 100 years from now as a disaster. I mean, if you go back to those days, I actually first got involved in media right on September 16, 2008 was my first appearance on Bloomberg TV to talk about GE. And so I remember those days, you know, when the financial crisis first bit hardest. And I, um, if you go back to those days, Oil at that point, I want to say, was up around 120, 140. Interest rates were way, way higher. We hadn't spent as much government debt, you know, so the government had a lot more borrowing, borrowing capacity, untapped borrowing capacity back then. The Treasury Department was run by a former Goldman Sachs guy who you can debate whether he did a good or a bad job, but I think we have to concede that he was not economically illiterate. And in that crisis, his opening salvo, I want to remind your audience, was that he ought to have basically unchecked, unlimited power to do whatever he wanted to do to try to rewrite the economy. And thankfully, Congress did not let that go through. You'll remember the first uh, stimulus uh, thing was voted down. Um, but you know that team uh, did, I'd say, a poor job, uh, but it pales in comparison to the utter disaster of Mr. Geithner, uh, and the various economic illiterates uh, in and around the Obama administration, um, in and around the excuse me, the Obama administration, who have gutted the traditional uh, contract between capital and uh, and company in the way that they uh, errantly claimed they restructured General Motors. We've talked about this in the in the past. That's one that that's a domino that's going to come toppling down hard, um, and. You know, it seems to be going out of its way, the Obama administration, to wage a continuing war against capitalism, against the best interest of uh, the young people coming up who need to save for the retirement and the older people who are going to be decimated in this coming financial crash. 
Well, Char Charles, are you familiar with um, one of the white papers that Barack Obama Sr. wrote? He wrote that um, that the uh, average citizen, they should have 100% of their income tax, and then the government should rebate it back and distribute all the income, throughout, uh, completely redistribute all the income from society. And that's who, you know, Obama grew up around and was learning from, him and Frank Marshall Davis, who was also, you know, a card-carrying Communist Party member. So, you know um, – I, I don't really care what color skin Barack Obama is. He's he's a Marxist, just you know hiding around. I think he mentioned even in his biography, Charles, he called the private sector the enemy. <laughs> so um, you know we don't hear because the mainstream media, most of it anyway, is so biased in favor of the Democratic political party that they're not going to call him out on this stuff. And obviously they don't fact check. So uh, most people are still asleep. You know, um, the average person maybe they watched. The State of the Union, maybe they did a State of the Union drinking game. Um, either they don't have enough time to care about the, the uh, economy and what's really happening, or maybe they don't have any money saved up and they don't think they need to know because, you know, they don't have any money to invest, or they just don't care at all. So, um, you know, uh, it's, just, it's just really sad, the state that Americans have fallen into. But I, I think a lot of it's because of central planning that, you know, we just have so much misallocation of capital the government, really since 2008 and these spending programs, they've just misallocated so much money. And, you know, with the GDP statistics, government spending, any government spending is counted as positive. These um, Obamacare, which is an enormous tax, I mean, the I think the cost of Obamacare rise every year, right, and there's huge penalties and fines on those. It's a tax, right? But yet it was counted positively for GDP. So there's just so much, you know, garbage, garbage in, garbage out, as they say, I guess, for these formulas and assumptions and models. Well, you know, the scary thing is, you know, you, you're absolutely right to point out, and actually Keynes, who I think, you know, should be, he, he should be dug up if he was buried, and he should be hanged, drawn, and quartered <laughs> uh, the way that uh, Charles II did after he was reinstalled in 1660-odd uh, uh, to the people who killed his father. Um, you know, when you go back and you think about the biggest risk facing each of us here. It's not what you not yet what is being discussed on CNBC or Bloomberg or Fox Business or, or the major media. The biggest risk is counterparty risk. Nobody knows exactly at a given moment in time, even the JP Morgans, the Citibanks, the big places, nobody really knows the true state of the balance sheet at any moment in time now because there's so much wind shear in the financial markets. You know, people have put on these leveraged positions. Governments are about to do these uh, uh, crazy things, as we're watching in Greece. Um, and the banks uh, ha really have such thin capital structures to begin with. I mean, they have a strong bank might might have equity to tangible hard net worth. Uh, sorry, uh, tangible net worth to assets of 10 percent, maybe. And that's you know that's that's reaching. Our own Federal Reserve Bank has nowhere near that capital strength, and it has a government, as we mentioned behind it, that is run by economic illiterates who are overspent already. So, you know, around the world, people have trapped money in, in bank accounts. They're getting nothing in the way of interest to speak of. The, uh, in the quiet of the night last year, uh, the major governments and central banks got together and have, have changed the protocol under which bank deposits will be treated in any more bail-ins. So those deposits you think are safe that are earning you maybe 60 basis points or 1% per year when inflation is raging, when those banks get crushed, as I fear they will, you're going to go in and discover that either you can't have access to the deposit you thought you would get you know, in the same time frame or, or indeed that it's been wiped out. And that's at deposit level. Then you start thinking about, you know, the, the various leveraged companies, uh, the various leveraged people. Um, and instead of doing the right thing, uh, fo focusing in on the problem, which we could have done back in September of 2008 or earlier, uh, of saying, you know, there's just too much leverage on the, United, on the global economy, too much debt, uh, incomes are under threat. You know, we have to get ready for a rainy day. Let's encourage people to pay down their debts. Let's encourage banks to be more prudent. Let's think very specifically about what, who our friends are and who our enemies are, whether they're threats we have to deal with once and for all. If so, let's deal with them. And I'm th speaking there of radical Islamist jihadism. Uh, you know, let's figure out what we're going to do, what Putin's up to. Uh, is he just going to stir up trouble forever, and is there no way to reason with him? 
or does he have a set of, of, of points that we need to understand better? Um, and, you know, there I've written controversially about the speech that he gave in Davos uh, in 2009, I think it was January 27th, uh, where he actually pointed out six years ago now the very problems that we are facing today. And, of course, we didn't listen to him. Well, I think the problems in the global economy have been transparent for a while. You know, we have a world reserve currency, a petrodollar, where there's been uh, just humongous extra artificial demand for dollars, where um, basically the United States government can print extra dollars and trade them for other goods and services that other countries have to work their butts off to produce. And all those dollars, you know, just get shipped offshore, whether it's to Japan or China or Saudi Arabia or OPEC uh, or any of the other developing countries in the G20. And you're not trading goods and services for goods and services. And this is why, you know, under a gold standard, things worked because when there was trade imbalances, right, gold was shipped back um, to the country from the country that had gold that was running a trade deficit to the country that was running a trade surplus, uh, the country that was running the, the trade deficit, their currency fell, uh, the, the government and the economy worked their butts off to produce more. And, you know, we don't have that now with the way GDP is calculated with the Keynesians, with the way the U.S. government's uh, doing business now. Um, it's just been an exorbitant privilege. And um, the system, it's, it's not sustainable in the current status quo. I can't tell you exactly when the current uh, global economic system will, you know, collapse and the new one will be put in place. But I would be very surprised if the current system lasts another seven years, there's just too many imbalances here where, like I said, the U.S. doesn't really have to create any more full-time jobs or new products or services to trade with other countries. Um, you know, we have these phony GDP statistics where um, they're adding in all these assumptions and calculations and things like that, saying that, oh, our GDP is higher, but it's not counting so many other things. Yeah, I think, you know, actually what I think is another problem that doesn't get enough focus is that um, – the talking heads, uh, when they, they report on the state of the economy, um, what they're reporting on is really the, the course of supposed economic progress in a year, which is one interesting you know, discussion to have. But over time, you know, people forget that even back in the 20s, America was a rich country in the 20s. There was a stock of wealth that had been built up. You can debate how it was built up, but it nonetheless existed. There was a stock of wealth in Europe. Uh, there was a stock of wealth in other places, surprisingly, in like Argentina and other things like that. So the, the ratio of accumulated wealth to economic output, if you want to measure that by GDP or wages, uh, was lower. There wasn't as much wealth sloshing around as there is now in this period where, unfortunately, central banks have gone crazy and have broken all the rules, and instead of protecting uh, the real – value of wealth and acting responsibly by forcing the globe, the global economy, to put back in closer balance the, the amount of annual supply and annual demand. Instead of doing that, we've beginning, I argue, around uh, January 1st, 2009, that the world entered a kind of financial purgatory. Until very recently, we didn't know whether we were in heaven or in hell. Uh, President Obama in the State of the Union speech tried to pretend that we were on our way to heaven. I think the markets have, uh, are, are rising up now. I think you're going to see more of this. I mean, the results, the, the substantive results, as, as far as you can see them coming out of these big companies that will be fleshed out in the 10K reports that come out next month in, in February, the numbers that are you know, in these, these uh, phone calls and conference calls and fancy uh, uh, PowerPoint presentations, the details behind these numbers are ugly. What you're seeing is that uh, big companies like GE and, and Caterpillar and others, when you look hard at their numbers, in the first case, their revenues are falling. Their total worldwide revenues are falling. When you, they don't give good uh, details about inside the U.S. and foreign sales and profits earned by selling from U.S. bases to U.S. customers, profits earned by selling from U.S. bases to foreign customers and cash flows. They don't, they're not required to give that data out. But the, the glimpses that they give show to me already, and we'll get more details like this, that for all this pump priming, for all the genius behind Jeff Immelt's uh, supposed stimulus plan and the president's stimulus plan, for all of that and all this easing, these large multinationals, first of all, they, they don't see places to invest sensibly. Their capital investments are tiny. So the notion that you know 
if, if the private sector can't find places to invest, a bunch of, of community organizers and communist sympathizers and academic left-wing professors are going to invent projects out of thin air that will make sense has proven to be as fallacious as you might have thought it was based on just a, a cursory investigation into what happened with the $787 billion stimulus starting spending in, the, in 2009. So the big companies are not going to invest our way out of the problem, and the big companies aren't going to hire our way out of the, the problem. What you see in the employment numbers they disclose is that large companies – are, are cutting their employment bases. I think you're going to see you know, one of the largest employers in the Dow is McDonald's and, with over 400,000 employees. I think as a result of all this posturing, this absurd posturing by President Obama and his inept uh, economic team, you're going to see McDonald's hasten the day when they eliminate these part-time jobs completely in favor of more kiosks, more mechanization, a change in the format of the restaurants, uh, you know, I think you're going to see large companies like IBM, there's a rumor that they're going to cut their employment by a quarter, by 100,000 people maybe. Uh, I don't understand why they wouldn't. I mean, given, given how much technology has changed in recent years and decades and how, how it's set to change in the future, why wouldn't a company filled with people who claim they understand technology harness technology to eliminate as many human workers as possible? Yeah, and especially because these larger corporations, Charles, have enormous access to, I would say, artificially cheap debt. Um, you know, McDonald's, um, all these large cap companies, they are financially engineering higher earnings. You mentioned a key part here about the revenue growth. There is no real top line revenue growth. At best, for maybe some of these large cap, cap companies, they're growing revenue 1% or 2%. Um, I read David Einhorn's newsletter a number of months ago in 2014. He made the awesome point about how basically you know, they play this game every quarter, uh, these large cap companies, where they financially engineer higher earnings and beat by a penny. But that's despite you know, their, revenue falling apart, their revenues falling lower, um, their earnings dropping, but they're on the conference, they're on the phone almost every day to all their analysts on Wall Street who cover the stock talking the bar down. So, and then, you know, um, the, the, re the revenues may have dropped from um, the earlier in the year estimate 40% for one quarter, and the stock's not being penalized because these stupid trend trading algorithm computers see that, oh, they beat the new earnings estimates by a penny, despite the fact that everything's been, you know, down revised 40%. So um, for a value investor, this is a head-scratcher to me. Um, this is why I don't buy lar uh, many, if any, uh, lar regular uh, consumer large-cap stocks right now because they're financially engineering higher earnings, not based on any fundamental reality, and they're playing these games, you know, to, um, to beat the numbers that um, obviously in an in a honest free market, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have these types of things, but they're able to get away with it through either cheap debt and financial engineering and, you know, messing with the uh, analysts who cover the stock and things like that. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely, I, mean I look at the Dow 30 and I, uh, for, for the simple reason that I like to, to understand their finances. I believe that, you know, I'm not saying I would invest in it really all but maybe one or two of them at this point. Uh, but it's, it's useful to, to you know, understand their finances, see what they're disclosing, see the trends that um, – they're putting forward because then you can decide uh, how to price investing in smaller companies that may not have the same set of advantages on the one hand, but on the other hand, the smaller companies can be bought in an acquisition premium, which is most unlikely uh, for any of the Dow companies. One of the things I have also been struck uh, about the Dow, I mean, going way back, they changed the Dow periodically, but they've been you know, changing the Dow like a cheap suit. Uh, back and forth, adding this company, subtracting that company. And so uh, the Dow, as you know, is not a uh, standard. It, you know, they, they use conventions to come up with the actual number, the so-called divisor. They don't take the 30 stocks and assume that at the beginning of the year you equal weight and investment in each one and compute, you know, what the return would be if you did that. It's a, it's, it's a misleading figure. In fact, you know, you can make the case, and this is sort of going to shock your audience because I think people may know that I'm rather conservative economically, but I think 2015 may and the coming years may, may mark a, ch a change in politics that really should be noted because I think you and, and people like me and others uh, are pointing out that it's very dangerous to the investing world at large, which includes the pension funds of unions and public sector pension funds. 
and mom and pops. These people are going to be devastated in this next correction that is, is going to, has been allowed to happen really with the connivance of academia, government, um, uh, people in media who don't do their homework, think tanks. Instead of sounding the alarm and, and saying, look, we've got some serious problems here. We can't allow a company like General Motors to do what it did, to go and you know, uh, hoodwink the American public into injecting a whole bunch of capital into it on a supposed plan that was going to increase employment in the United States without mentioning all the negative things that then happened to you know, the, the precedents that were broken that affect our bankruptcy laws that are going to make it very difficult in the next crash to convince people to put fresh money in to rescue these companies out of bankruptcy, and there will be many, uh, to, people are going to start studying and say, you know, where are these projections that General Motors put together Back in 2009, what did they say in 2009 would be the financial performance in 2014 and 2015 on key metrics? How come the public who rescued General Motors, the American taxpayer, how come we never got to see those projections, never got to see the variance? And why was it that the uh, U.S. government rushed to sell out of that position, to characterize it as a big success in the 2012 and then sell out at a loss? You know, an ordinary human being in the private sector could not do that. In fact, I'd go so far as to say with a, with a um, Department of Justice and an SEC that would do its proper job, that would protect uh, the, the investor, and, and particularly the unschooled investor, would not have allowed that transaction, the rescue or the exit, either one, to have occurred. Yeah, this is very interesting. I, I think the taxpayer – and also the purchasing power of the dollar is going to end up on the hook for these um these promises you know these un underfunded liabilities so there's going to be bailouts there's going to be more crony capitalism and corru corruption um ron paul was able to get a one-time partial audit of the fed and i think 16 trillion dollars was given out at the height of the crisis you know neither low or no interest rate loans to corporations to large corporations to other global central banks and that was only a partial audit so i'm thinking it was a lot more than the 16 trillion they said but i, I think charles this goes back to central banking and Keynesian economics, it just creates moral hazard in the system. It sets up improper incentives throughout all of the economy. Um, there's just so many people now because Keynesian economics is such gobbledygook. It doesn't make any rational sense that a lot of people hate economics. Um, and there's so many people on Main Street, you know, that that run a business but don't understand economics that that well. And um, you know, if they actually understood what was really going on in the economy, maybe they wouldn't make bad investments and things like that. So if, you know, if they watch the news and hear President Obama, they think the economy's doing well. They run their own small business. They make an investment. The business could go bad. Whereas, you know, if they did their own market research or paid attention to someone else doing better due diligence than what President Obama had to say or any of these other um, academic Keynesian economists or some of the, you know, Wall Street Keynesians, then, um, you know, they would know that it's not smart right now to make certain investments into certain things unless they're in a certain market that's going to do well, either in inflation or maybe it's uh, the type of market where um, it's fairly insulated inflation or deflation for the economy contracting. Yeah, I mean, let's look at two pieces of advice that this uh, president has recently given. I mean, on the one hand, uh, here you have uh, an academic system, and I'm very – you know, my parents and I, uh, my children all believe passionately, my family believes passionately in studying hard, the merits of doing that. If you have a knack for studying, you pick something you like, it's, it's really worth doing that. But, you know, the equation today of, you know, let's say you are fortunate enough, you, you, you're not fortunate enough to be poor enough to get a complete ride at, say, a top university. So you're stuck, uh, you get into the top university, but they say you, you have to, you know, do your share to finance a portion of it, maybe a significant portion of it. You're saddled today with, I have young friends who are saddled with over, you know, hundreds, almost $200,000 in student loans having gone through uh, college and then graduate school. Um, that's a lot of money to have to pay off, um, especially under a tax code. This president is, is just, there isn't a tax that he doesn't want to increase. So, you know, t you, the, the people who, the people who, like you and others, who, who uh, took time growing up to maybe not do play around and instead to hit the books hard and study and do well, those people now face this uncomfortable choice where, um, you know, to, to get a, 
one degree or two degrees is going to cost a lot of money. And then they look out of the job landscape in this country and they see, you know, jobs disappearing. They see politicians saying, you know, blatant lies about the, the, the actual state of the uh, economy. Then maybe they land a job and they're the first in and you get a sideways hit and the economy goes down and, and you lose that entry level job. Then you're in even worse shape. So people just coming onto the workforce now are in bad shape. And then again, you know, for, for this president and this team to suggest to, to, to float a plan encouraging people to buy, particularly retirees, to buy U.S. government debt at, you know, low interest rates today, there should be a law against giving that kind of financial advice. I mean, you should have to, it's, it's, that's worse than Bernie Madoff advice. I mean, there's no way to justify locking up somebody age 55, 60, 65 years into a 10, 20, 30 year, year bond yielding 2% when inflation, however you care to define it, is certainly higher than 2%. And when the costs that that retiree pool will bear going forward certainly are rising faster than uh, whatever the average rate of inflation is for the population as a whole. So, I mean, this you guys uh, at the Wall Street... Uh, for Main Street are doing America and the world a service, breaking down these issues and helping people to think them through. But the one thing that is you, you can take to the bank about this administration, anything they are telling you about the economy, you should assume the opposite is true. <laughs> it's like what the Soviets. <laughs> no, I, 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 uh, in my first job, I, the big boss at that firm took uh, another partner aside and, 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 and told them that um, – you know, there's actually one thing, the surprising thing is really valuable in life. If you can find somebody who's always wrong, that's as valuable, obviously, as finding somebody who's always right. But, you know, somebody who's always right is most likely not going to talk to you. But yeah. somebody who's always wrong, you know, and there are, probably, there are a lot of people like that, I suppose. But this president and this team, I mean, imagine allowing whoever is handling him allowing him to give that rosy speech about the economy without knowing first, you know, what the various large companies were going to report, you know, allowing um, surrogates for the administration to go and say, oh, yeah, strong dollars, great for the U.S. economy. I actually think it is good for the U.S. economy, but for perverse reasons. But, you know, he, the, they go up and say, yeah, this policy makes a ton of sense. And, and CEO after CEO in this earnings season has, has this week and today said – that it's killing their businesses. Well, the, the State of the Union, Charles, in my opinion, has been propaganda for a very long time. I mean, I think you can go back to either Richard Nixon or Jimmy Carter, um, and every president since basically has been talking about how we'll be energy independent in the near future. So, I mean, and there's other, you know, ridiculous claims that have been mentioned in there, too, that people really just don't get – called out on but um you know boots on the ground anecdotal evidence here i live right outside uh, washington dc dc metro area um three of the five richest average median family income counties in the whole country are right outside of washington dc and um i was just at my local uh I, I can give you examples of my food bill going up a lot since 2005. My food bill's up probably more than double since 2005 when I graduated college in 2006. It's up definitely double. My health care bill is going up like crazy. Um, yes, my gasoline bill's a little bit cheaper in the last couple than it was the last couple years, but I don't think it can stay this low. But I can tell you almost no one I know, and I know lots of people. We speak with a lot of people on this podcast all over the world who um, email us or post underneath that almost no one I know – Who's, who considers themselves middle class or working class, has that much discretionary income. So if you don't have discretionary income, how is the economy going to do well? You don't have money for savings to, to invest. You don't have extra money to spend on vacations or things like that. I mean, this, this economy is functioning on debt. I was at the Sprint store in uh, Tyson's Corner, which is you know one of the richest areas in all of this area, and they were talking about how people there, when, when you walk in, I heard the sales associate say, you know, you don't have to even pay cash for an iPhone now oh, or a Samsung Galaxy S5, you know, a brand new phone. These things are only five or $600, and the majority of people walking into the store now don't even have the cash to pay up front for it. They're on payment plans, you know, to pay an extra $20, $30 a month for it. So this doesn't, this doesn't speak well of the economy, in my opinion, at least. Well, that's why I go back. If, if your audience takes one thing away from this, this discussion, I hope they will Google Consumer Expenditure Survey and then go look at that data, uh, especially the biquintile data. And what that data shows 
is, and it, it echoes other data that's available, um, the underlying reality that the top 20% of households is responsible for all the savings in America in a given year, all the incremental savings. The bottom 80%, uh, actually in, in 2012, the bottom 80%, I think from memory, saved 200 bucks per household in the entire year. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I, I have, you know, the, the unemployment rate is really low for this area, Charles, but um, even with a full-time job around here, there, there's a lot of friends I know. Some of them have two or three part-time jobs or one full-time job and one part-time job, and they're barely sleeping, and they can barely, barely pay their bills. They don't have that much in savings. So um, uh, maybe, you know, they're spendthrifts. I don't think they are. Maybe some of them are, but um, – yeah, I, I just don't think the society, it's not generating free cash flow. It's not generating an enormous amount of capital and savings. I think, you know, this financial repression policy that the politicians and the Keynesian central banks all over the world, it's been, you know, transferring wealth, uh, raising the cost, the, the everyday cost of living for people in the middle class to survive. And it's been transferring wealth from people on Main Street to, you know, um, the, the really ultra rich and the politicians. Uh, through financial repression and artificially low interest rates and savers, so um, people can make money off asset prices and things like that. That's why, you know, uh, even last year, the Tiffany's was still doing pretty well. Neiman Marcus was still doing pretty well for a certain amount of time. And, you know, Lamborghini and Ferrari dealerships were doing well because the people on Wall Street, the hedge fund managers, those guys who could, you know, do yen carry trades and things like this, they were still making enormous killings. But um, I, I don't know how much um, the Keynesians can keep these asset bubbles going without enormous consequences going forward. Well, I think you know you're right. I mean, one one thing that is a theme I'm trying to hit a little bit in my uh, in writing. Every part of the global economy has been disrupted by technology, save for the government. You know, you go back to uh, 1789. There was an argument why – and people debated whether we should have a strong central government. But there was an argument when America you know, had little infrastructure that maybe you need to give some extra power to a federal government. And there was an argument after World War II that we needed you know, more power to the central government. To, and, and good things were done for periods of decades. But you know, in the period 98, 99 forward, why exactly – did we need to allow this government to grow in size and scope and scale? And people itself, you know, you, I'm struck by the various scandals and the various people who come forward and eventually, if they do testify, they all try the Obama excuse. Well, I found out about that watching it on TV. Or I found out about <laughs> Or I'm not responsible. You know, it's a big government. It's tough to manage. I mean, think about the way the media landscape has been has been demolished by the combination of Craigslist taking out all the uh, local listings and then the internet and and other things eviscerating and and and, and thankfully breaking Oh yeah Google Yeah Google's taken most of the advertising dollars right Well and, Google and Facebook Right and, and but in the others you know it used to be that the the mainstream media basically had a lock on what passed for analysis of events inside this country thanks to the internet that has changed for the moment, unless President Obama gets his way and mischievously uh, clamps down on the internet. Uh, but you know what we need is we need to unlock some of these smart minds around the, the world. We need to go back to base principles and say, inside our government, why exactly should the cost of government grow each year? Why should these officials, who don't seem to do much and hire all these third-party contractors outside the military, uh, you know, to, to marshal up all these expensive programs. Today, I, I noticed, uh, you know, I had seen and others had seen that, you know, the accounting, as you would expect for Obamacare, was flawed from the beginning in that it had uh, 10 years of taxes covering five years of spending. And, you know, even then it was, didn't look like such a good deal. Was a report came out moments ago that suggests that Obamacare has cost this government $50,000 per policy. Wow. You know, so, I mean, we need to go back. 
we have I, I think a good and the costs the costs are never what they say right so this um community college policy right i think he's saying it'll cost 60 billion it's probably going to cost you know 600 billion at least just like what the promises that were made um from lbj right in the 60s about medicare and medicaid right he said oh it'll only cost six billion dollars or something by a certain date and then it cost more than more than a hundred times that amount or something some enormous it was off by a, uh, an exponential amount Exactly. I mean, it, 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 what's really bad here is that, you know, here we have, we, we've elected and reelected a team that has demonstrated that it is economically incompetent, and I would argue in geopolitics, important geopolitics, well, incompetent. And, uh, you know, they have yet to be held to the task, and we believe in America that, you know, we can control our own destins, destiny. We, 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 we can have an argument, Charles, whether or not they're either stupid or intentionally tr lying and trying to sabotage things, maybe both. <laughs> 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 the, the goal of Marx and um, the goal of Marx, if you look through and some of the other Fabian socialists who have written about it, was to always, you know, start sabotaging um, capitalism, things like that through different subversive means. So um, <laughs> let's I would like to hope that that's not the case. But sadly, you know, looking back to the long litany of bad decisions that this team has made, you know, you're. you're your case seems to hold more water. Yeah, I, I think there's there's some people there that intentionally want to sabotage the capitalist system. Um, unfortunately, I think there's a lot of you know very book smart professors who you know just have a certain ideology and they just they hate anyone making a profit in capitalism and things like that, and they just want to destroy it. Um, and I think that started to pervade uh, since I live right outside of D.C. I mean, I've dealt with a good amount of these people. There's a good amount of people in the bureaucracy like that, um, a good amount of people um, uh, also in the Democratic Party like that. Not everyone in the Democratic Party is like that. There's still some good business people who consider themselves Democrats. Think, guess they, I guess they feel guilty after they make a lot of money. But um, there's a lot of people in there in the Democratic Party, you know, who are just um, – who are anti-profit, anti-business, anti-capitalist, um, period. They don't want any type of uh, beneficial economic system where people, you know, have a chance to work hard and, and rise through the ranks through hard work and making uh, – solving other people's problems. Well, it's worth the debate. I mean, you know, I suppose there, there were periods in our history, of, you know, monopolists uh, went too far. But, you know, if you think about the private sector, we don't just face competition inside this country. There's robust competition around the world in the private sector. And if you can manage to actually sell products and services into that fiercely competitive market and manage these businesses, it's tough to do it in a way that there's some money left over. Is that profit, that money left over, a bad thing? Well, I don't think it's bad at all. And on the other hand, isn't it much worse to create these gigantic bureaucracies that we cannot fund without borrowing money that, you know, if scored properly – Considering the the long term contingent liabilities that you know that are going to run out for for decades, maybe centuries, these things are hemorrhaging. Not, these are loss making public sector operations that are not even helping the intended beneficiaries of the operation. I agree. Yeah, there's there's a lot of government bureaucrats around here, Charles, who make you know forty thousand, sixty thousand. If they have a certain number of degrees, they can get a higher salary. If they know someone, they can get their. Uh, who's already in the door, they can get their foot in the door if they have multiple degrees. There are some government bureaucrats here in the Washington, D.C. area, a pretty good amount of them, you know, making six figures who I don't know what the hell they do. <laughs> they make six figures a year, you know, way more. They have 100 percent job security, and I, I don't think they're helping uh, society or government or the economy really at all. And, um, you know, I, I, I hate when the government, you know, they're not rapidly trying to fight costs like – what in a lot of cases the private sector is doing to become more efficient, you have these promises from politicians, and you know Obama, Obama's promise here with the community college is just the latest one. Obamacare, um, you know the the amount of cost for Obamacare are going to skyrocket too for how much Obama said it was going to cost. Um, and same thing with the community colleges. But you can go back through history and you can go look up other speeches from other presidents who promised that this program would only cost this much 10, 20, 30 years from now, and it's ended up costing you know tens of billions of dollars a lot more than they said. So I, 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 that, that type of behavior in the private sector, maybe it could go on for a certain amount of time, but it couldn't go on for much longer uh, – for infinitely like it can uh, from what it seems like with government – um, you know, in the private sector, people get fired, firms would go bankrupt, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, well, I think, you know, we've got a period here. I, I hope we're going to have the time to um, get into these issues, to have more people focus upon them, to actually fix the problem. But, you know, certainly the election coming up in 2016, assuming we make it to that election without a catastrophe, is the most important election I know of in my lifetime. 
And, you know, it is time, and I'm glad you are exposing these issues and you know, getting a growing audience. I hope more and more people will contact you and get involved and ask the tough questions that need to get asked of these people who pretend they are actually serving the public's interest but are not. Exactly. They're just pretending. So they may say, you know, that they're, they'll lie and cheat or do whatever, say whatever in order to get elected. And then as soon as they get elected, um, you know, one term, two terms later, they haven't done anything they've said. They haven't even tried to do anything they've said. They spend almost all their time doing fundraising. They don't even read the bills they sign. Most of them, some of them don't even get a summary. And they've made, you know, five, 10, 15, 20 million dollars for themselves through crony deals and, you know, just sucking off the system like a rent-seeking parasite. So I'm, I'm just fed up with um, business as usual in D.C. The, the majority of people, Charles, don't even think there's a problem at all in D.C. They live in such an enormous bubble, uh, Republican or Democrat. You know, there's a, a large amount of people here. There's a lot of Republicans, too, who are, who are Keynesians. Um, they just disagree where to spend the money. You know, they want to spend more money. They want to go – they want to go uh, – invade uh, Russia, they want to attack Putin, they want to take over um, all the oil uh, in the Middle East, they want to you know, do all these military endeavors and spend the money that way instead of um, the welfare programs that the Democrats may necessarily want to spend. So it's just very frustrating for me. Um, I'm, I'm really surprised that the uh, dollar has withstood as much as it has, but um, I think – I guess it's because everyone else – who's using this Keynesian playbook globally. They're all trying to devalue their currency, so the dollar then ends up being the strongest temporarily, but um, I don't think any of this is sustainable for much longer. Um, I, I actually think Putin, compared to Obama, is a lot more reasonable, especially if you listen to a lot of his speeches. He understands that there's a lot of problems here, and um, you know he's not – He's trying to figure out an alternative system here that's a little bit more balanced in terms of world trade and things like that. But, um, you know, the U.S. politicians, Obama, Republicans, Democrats, um, I don't really think there's more than – economically, there's really not a huge amount of difference between most of them. Um, they, they just – they want to keep spending money. I mean, even the decreases in spending the Ryan plan, right, when um, he was the vice president running – uh, with uh, who, uh, with Mitt Romney, the Ryan plan wasn't a real cut in spending. It was just a, a decrease in the increase. So it's it's all you know cosmetic and BS and lipstick on the pig, in my opinion. I sh well um, hmm? I sh well um, go ahead, hmm? go ahead. Well um, in in wrapping up this interview, Charles, um, please tell our listeners where they can uh, read your articles. Well, actually, I, uh, since the last time I came on, I've uh, put up the site www.charlesortel.com, which is spelled O-R-T-E-L, one L. And what I try to do there is I write for various people and, and I have various uh, appearances. I try to put as many of those on that site as possible. The other thing to do is to follow me on Twitter, at Charles Ortel, uh, with uppercase O. Um, those would be the two easiest places. I, I try to be pretty good about responding to comments and tweets. Um, people have questions, feel free to contact me and uh, keep up the excellent work. Thank you. And, um, you know, you talked about that education problem with the student loan debt. I think Wall Street for Main Street, once we get the virtual classrooms, the son, I was telling you a little bit about that before we start recording. I think we can really help people out so they can learn useful information at a lot uh, more affordable price. and more efficiently with, you know, successful experts such as yourself maybe teaching counting classes instead of um, some of these lower level universities where people pay, you know, tens of thousands of dollars and they're not really getting anything quality for the amount of money they're spending. Well, Jason, thanks for having me on. Regards to your partner, Mo, and all the best of luck.